head into these I mean, trying, trying times. And I could have told you that's not what you should ask me to do. <laughs> where, <laughs> that's not my sweet spot. Where do, where's the Problem Solvers Caucus in America's Mayors in January of 2025? Well, first, you are America's Problem Solvers Caucus. Please understand that. Excellent. You are America's Problem Solvers. And, and I just would say uh, to you that I, I do believe this nonpartisan consensus oriented effort, call it problem solvers because that's what we, we, we associate as, call it whatever you want. Uh, there's a place in America for that. It's where, it's where most people live. It's where the work gets done. It's where the problems get solved. It's where the challenges get overcome. Do not, do not shrink from your responsibility to be America's problem solvers. And I will offer to you that when you, you said mayor, executive, Congress, when I die, the only title I want on whatever little plaque my kids leave for me <laughs> is mayor. Once a mayor, Always a mayor. We understand the challenge. I mean, the we pandering get is the job done. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a small plaque. I mean, it's just unbelievable. the pandering is unbelievable. I, absolutely. <laughs> I, listen, I, I deal with county executives and town supervisors all the time. I tell them I love all my children equally. I just happen to love mayors more. <laughs> uh, please uh, thank these incredible members of Congress. For thank you guys for what you do. Thank you so much. Their engagement, their service. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you, you all. Thanks. What a great panel. Thank you all for joining us this morning and being part of that. And thanks to the two members of Congress for making time for us in what has been a very busy and eventful week. Uh, now, on to our Dollar Wise Innovation Grant Awards. Dollar Wise is the economic mobility campaign of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, supported by the founding sponsor, Bank of America. Dollar Wise works with cities across the country to remove barriers to economic mobility, improve work skills, and create intergenerational wealth for underserved residents. The campaign supports such programs as driver's license restoration, re-entry assistance, and support to childcare providers. This year, DollarWise will award seven cities with $10,000 each to foster innovation programs that can be replicated in communities across the country. Pleased to announce this year's winners and their projects. Please hold your applause until the end. Anaheim Mayor Ashley Aitken, who will use the grant to support the cultural district of Little Arabia with entrepreneurial assistance, which offers business educational courses in Arabic and English. Colorado Springs Mayor Yimi Mubalade, who will focus on resource support for justice impacted homeless residents to mitigate future legal challenges and meet their immediate and most pressing needs. Finley Mayor Christina Mern, who will use the grant to help individuals with convictions petition for a certificate of qualification for employment. Montgomery Mayor Stephen Reed will utilize Montgomery's M Transit system to provide affordable rides to support participants in accessing educational opportunities, job interviews, and work. Richmond Mayor LaVar Stoney will use the grant to train Richmond residents as birth doulas to address unemployment, child care barriers, and poor maternal outcomes. Rochester, New York Mayor Malik Evans will use the grant to introduce an estate planning and home weatherization program for black and brown homeowners. Santa Fe Mayor Alan Weber plans to implement a program that offers incentives, coaching, and business support for home-based child care providers. Please join me in congratulating each of our winning mayors. We look forward to hearing about their progress at our annual meeting this summer uh, in June in Kansas City. Thank you for your important work.
Congratulations again to our winners and thanks to Bank of America for your incredible support. And now I'd like to invite the Senior Vice President of State and Local Government Relations at Bank of America to say a few words. Please welcome Brian Putler. Mayor Ginther, thank you very much for having me again, and uh, congratulations to this year's winning mayors. Bank of America is so proud to be the founding sponsor of DollarWise campaign, and the innovation grants that, our, uh, that we support. With more than 100 innovation grants made now by DollarWise, mayors are helping communities improve their economic health and success. Our community's biggest problems cannot be solved by government alone or private industry alone. Rather, government and business are most effective at problem solving when we work together, and we are proud to be your partner. Thank you, mayors, for the important work you are doing in your communities to help them thrive, and again, congratulations to this year's winning mayors. Okay, a little louder, a little louder, okay, that's much better. <laughs> okay, the United States Conference of Mayors worked tirelessly to encourage the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law in the 118th Congress. Okay, through the leadership of President Biden, it finally became a reality. Now with our federal agency partners, we face the monumental task of implementing the 1.2 trillion law within five short years. So the nation's mayors stand ready to rise to the occasion. To navigate the multitude of infrastructure programs in law, Bloomberg Philanthropies has partnered with the United States Conference of Mayors and other organizations to create the local infrastructure hub. Raise your hands, who has used the hub? Awesome, okay. This is such a great tool. The hub provides assistance to cities during the application process and has been an invaluable resource as we access the historic infrastructure funding. But don't take my word for it. Here are what mayors are saying about the local infrastructure hub. Infrastructure reaches all aspects of a city and so we've got to rebuild our infrastructure. We've got to rebuild America. Making sure that we're preparing our city for the future. We have more opportunities for federal support at the city level right now than we've ever had in the history of this country. We're all limited with the staff that we have. That's what the local infrastructure hub does. It helps cities of every size. And we know where that money needs to be spent to ensure a high quality of life for our constituents. The bipartisan infrastructure law has been transformational in Cincinnati. We've received about $500 million in grants to reconnect disinvested communities that were frankly destroyed by national infrastructure highway projects in the 50s and 60s. We received the Thriving Communities Grants to create uh, more safe bike and pedestrian pathways and roads for people to drive through. This will be an economic development driver, a transportation mobility solution. We invested in water and sewer, electricity grid. And to make sure that we can bring more high-speed internet to communities that I have not had that opportunity. It also will provide more jobs for everyone. I just want to thank the Local Infrastructure Hub because without us working together, I don't think that we would have the impact that I know we're going to have. Washington, D.C. is willing to partner with us to get it done. We thank the Local Infrastructure Hub for everything that they are doing to help us navigate this incredible opportunity. All right, now please welcome to the stage the Senior Director of Government Innovation. We're not supposed to give them titles at Bloomberg, so I apologize. But please welcome to the stage uh, from Bloomberg Philanthropies, Jamie Lavin. She's amazing. I love this woman. She's a change maker. Come on out, Jamie. 
Thank you so much, Mayor Sheedy, for that kind introduction and for your really outstanding leadership of the conference. It's such an honor to be joining this incredible group of mayors. On behalf of Mike Bloomberg and James Anderson and the entire team at Bloomberg Philanthropies, I'm proud to join you this morning for an update on how the Local Infrastructure Hub has been working with you, America's mayors, to seize the opportunities that Washington is providing to make your community safer, stronger, and more resilient. Since 2022, we've been working with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Thank you, Tom, Dave Gatton, and everyone on their outstanding team. Emerson Collective, Results for America, National League of Cities, Delivery Associates, and countless other partners to provide support for cities of all sizes nationwide to meet this once-in-a-generation opportunity. Together, we're navigating the historic funding available through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Our chief aim is to help you develop competitive, ambitious, and innovative grant applications and bring investment home to residents to address essential infrastructure needs. This will translate into safer roads, bridges, and railroads, more reliable drinking water and waste treatment, more resilient energy grids, wider access to broadband, and greater ability to mitigate flooding, benefits that your communities want and deserve. To date, we've worked with over 1,200 cities nationwide. This includes more than 3,200 local officials and over 270 mayors from every U.S. state. Already, local governments participating in our programs have won more than $1 billion in federal funding. I think that's worth a round of applause. <laughs> our programming supports mayors and cities in two key ways. First, we've hosted strategic sessions with federal officials, policy experts, mayors, and their key staff about grants for major types of infrastructure. In each of these sessions, we've heard from mayors about how they're undertaking the essential steps engaging with community, following the data, and partnering with stakeholders and residents to develop ambitious projects that will transform communities for generations to come. The good news is all of these ideas can be replicated, something we believe strongly in at Bloomberg Philanthropies. For instance, we've heard from Mayor Giles of Mesa, Arizona, about how his city has used micro-trenching, that's a fancy word for a lower cost way to lay fiber, to bring more affordable internet connectivity to their residents, expanding broadband access. We worked with the city then to develop an in-depth case study, which is available on our website, so you can all follow Mesa's blueprint. And then we've heard from Mayor Castor of Tampa, Florida. She shared how her city's tackling pedestrian safety with an ambitious Vision Zero plan. The new $20 million grant that they received through the Safe Streets and Roads for All program will allow Tampa to start implementing its plan its vision. And Mayor Bibb has shared how he's working side by side with Cleveland's residents, including through visits to his grandma's church, to identify the needs that are most important to the community, and those will shape their infrastructure priorities. To help the mayors and their teams, we've collected and published successful applications from cities around the country. These can serve as a roadmap and inspiration for your projects. It's helpful to know what good looks like. We look forward to welcoming more of the mayors in this room to elevate your successes and talk about what's not working. In going after infrastructure funds, the local infrastructure hub has created a framework through which mayors across the country are learning and winning together. The second key aspect of our program is designed to ensure that small and mid-sized cities get the resources that they need but often don't have to draw down infrastructure dollars for their communities. In collaboration with the National League of Cities, we created grant writing boot camps to help communities with populations under 150,000 residents to understand line by line how to create a competitive grant application. These boot camps deliver months long training from technical and policy experts, ensuring that municipal officials are well prepared in the art and science of applying for these particular forms of federal aid. Of the nearly 700 localities getting support through the boot camps, 77% have fewer than 50,000 residents, and 42% have fewer than 10,000 residents. We supported Athens, Ohio, led by Mayor Patterson, in developing a regional strategy on their EV charging grant application, which just last week was awarded millions. 
This grant's gonna finance a corridor of charging stations across 19 communities stretching from Athens to Dayton. Under Mayor Buffalo's leadership, Columbia, Missouri has deeply engaged, I think it's Missouri, has deeply engaged in our boot camp. And we're glad to hear that just last week, the city won millions to invest in charging and fueling infrastructure. This will enable Columbia to expand EV access to new stations, upgrade bus stops, and improve a vital transit center. Recognizing that Allentown, Pennsylvania doesn't have infrastructure project plans sitting on the shelf waiting for funding, Mayor Turk and his team jumped into our boot camps, including the Safe Streets and Roads for All plan grant, ah, planning grant sessions to access funds to develop the Vision Zero plan. Allentown is now using its $312,000 award to identify ways to make its streets safer for pedestrians and cyclists. We supported White Plains, New York, led by Mayor Roach, we just heard from, in five different boot camps, including the Safe Streets and Roads for All program, where the city was awarded a $400,000 planning grant. We're excited to continue supporting those of you who've gotten planning grants as you move towards implementation. Registrations open for our latest round of boot camps, kicking off next month. They're focused on safe streets and roads for all, charging and fueling infrastructure, the PROTECT program, clean water, climate pollution reduction grants, and tax credits available through the Inflation Reduction Act, which we've been talking about a lot in this conference. I encourage you to scan that QR code at your seats, stop by our booth, or go to our website to register today. Thanks to the Biden-Harris administration, and bipartisan support. Cities have an unprecedented opportunity to make vital investments in their infrastructure and improve their roads, bridges, water, and public transit, and so much more to make your community stronger and improve your residents' lives. I wanna also thank the federal agencies that have been coming into our local infrastructure hub programming and spending time with the mayors, explaining how these grant programs work and what they're looking for in reviewing applications. Among these leaders, of course, is a former mayor, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, who I'm excited to hear from shortly. This is exciting, gratifying work, and without help from all of these corners, philanthropic partners, technical and policy experts, federal infrastructure leaders, local officials, and mayors, countless worthy projects could go unfunded. This is the time. The local infrastructure hub brings this collective together to ensure cities get the resources they need to confront our pressing infrastructure challenges. We thank you all for stepping up and we're excited to keep working together to improve residents' lives and rebuild America. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you to Bloomberg Philanthropies. You guys have been amazing to us mayors, so thank you. All right, it is my honor to introduce a very special person who is no doubt familiar to all of you, I'm sure, the 19th United States Secretary of Transportation. The secretary leads the, U the U.S. Department of Transportation, where he has elevated so many important issues, especially safety, jobs, equity, climate, and innovation. He was instrumental in supporting the passage of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, a landmark legislative achievement. A law that is now moving billions of dollars into historic improvements that help us modernize and maintain America's transportation infrastructure. But we all remember and appreciate that before he stepped into this position, he was a mayor himself. Uh, he was the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. And I was talking to a mayor backstage and he said, oh, Hillary, I just wanted to introduce myself. I come from a little, you know, tiny, tiny town. I'm a nothing mayor. I said, are you kidding me? It doesn't matter what size of city you come from. You are massive when it comes to, you know, working in our cities and locally and working with each other. And I said, matter of fact, I said, someone I respect greatly who has done tremendous things um, is is obviously Mayor Pete Buttigieg. So I am super excited. Uh, during his time as mayor, he was very involved in the conference's agenda, helping lead on automation and advancing man manufacturing and among other issues. In our eyes, once a mayor, always a mayor, right? So please welcome Secretary Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Good to see 
to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for the warm welcome. Thanks to all of you for, uh, uh, for welcoming me back. It does feel good to be among America's mayors, especially at a time like this. Um, and uh, I especially appreciate, for those of you who are from around here or the Southwest, I appreciate you braving the elements to be here. If you're from the Midwest, I appreciate you suppressing your Midwestern instincts to tell everybody in Washington, D.C. how this isn't real snow. Um, uh, it's, all <laughs> it's all relative, it turns out. Um, but uh, I really do feel at home more than anywhere else when I am among uh, America's mayors. Uh, occasionally on the street, somebody will uh, say, hey, Mayor Pete, and then they'll stop and correct themselves like they think maybe they said something wrong. I always say that I wear that as a compliment. I was actually thinking back to when, when I first got elected, not even elected, after I got the nomination of my party for uh, mayor in my city. Uh, a couple days later, I got an email from a 10-year-old boy saying, congratulations. Uh, and now that you're mayor, I need to let you know that there's this intersection close to where I live. And uh, sometimes I wait there to get a ride. It's very dangerous. The cars speed uh, by there, and it needs a stop sign. And I wrote him back, unsure how he got my email address, and said, uh, you know, thanks so much for getting in touch. I'm not actually the mayor yet. I, I, I'm, I still have to win the general election, but, you know, I look forward to doing everything I can to make our streets safer. And... Uh, sure enough, I won the election. The very next day, I get an email from this 10, I think he's 11 now. Congratulations on getting elected. Now, I'd like to get back to the matter of the stop sign. <laughs> and once I took office uh, and understood how our Department of Public Works worked, I asked our uh, city engineer, do, does, do we have a process for this? And of course there is, and they did some math, and it turned out that it was justified. And next thing I knew, one of the first days in office, uh, we found the kid, and the two of us together installed a stop sign at the co corner of Don Moyer Avenue in South Bend, Indiana. And um, those are the kinds of things that are, <clears throat> you know as, as mayors what it's like. Uh, to have that incredibly immediate impact. Uh, the importance of your work readily intelligible to a 10-year-old child, uh, even as you deal with some of the most confounding issues in public policy and American politics and public administration today. And I always try to remember the spirit of those early days uh, navigating what our city government could do. As I work now in Washington with my administration colleagues under President Biden's leadership to try to make your job a little bit easier, especially at a time like this. The more I see division at the national and global levels, the more convinced I am that salvation comes from the local. And I believe in many ways the most meaningful measure of our success as an administration will be how communities are doing at a local level. Uh, or to put it another way, whether we are making your jobs easier as American mayors. And I hope that you'll agree that we are. Uh, you know, you face so many challenges that have become more fierce and more ferocious than when I was sitting at this table with the mayor's lanyard in this room six or seven years ago. But it also would have been nice back then if the President of the United States had launched a $1.2 trillion infrastructure investment coming to my city and every other in the United States. <laughs> We're here in the most literally concrete terms to support you in your work to make sure you succeed and to try to shape the culture of this place, Washington, D.C., to better reflect what is great about America's communities. Back when I was running for president, which is an effort I first made public from this very stage five years ago this week, I often said that we would be well served if Washington worked a little more like America's best run cities rather than the other way around. And I believe that even more strongly now. So what I wanted to do with our time together is share a few examples of how we have followed the lead of America's mayors and America's great communities, especially when it comes to transportation and what that could mean for what you're trying to do. I'll start with bipartisanship. One of the things I love and miss about the city level, which is especially important to highlight during the chaos of an election year like this, is that partisan considerations and loyalties don't dominate everything else that's going on. 
When I was mayor, I was just as likely to forge meaningful cooperative relationships with Republicans as with Democrats without pretending to be any more politically conservative than I was. And I was just as likely to be challenged by Democrats as by Republicans. Through this body, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, I came to know and work with and trust fellow mayors without considering, or in some cases without even knowing, their party affiliations. In fact, I'm conscious I'm addressing one of the only rooms left in America where hundreds of senior elected officials from both parties from around the country gather with shared priorities and shared purpose and actually like each other. That's a powerful thing. <clears throat> I'd be lying if I said we've gotten anywhere close to that culture on a routine basis here in Washington, but I have been struck at how much of the work we're doing is not just bipartisan, but often nonpartisan in its character. Take the very fact of the bipartisan infrastructure law, which we passed with your help and support, with a number of Republicans who are willing to cross party lines and work with Democrats and President Biden to get it done. Even though the idea of a bipartisan anything law was greeted with mockery when President Biden first took office. It, the obituary of that legislation that we now can't imagine not having, that obituary was written dozens of times by people saying that the president was on a fool's errand trying to get bipartisan cooperation, only for it to happen in ways that is now delivering results in every part of the country, red, blue, and purple. Sometimes it means eliminating dangerous railroad crossings in rural counties that probably haven't voted with my party in decades. We were in Millen, Georgia recently, where trains that can be more than two miles long pass every day. They cut off an entire half a town from the other half. I was out there in December to celebrate a grant to fix that crossing, making it easier and safer to get around town. We're doing that kind of work. At the same time, we're funding transit improvements in East and West Coast cities like New York, where last fall I signed the final funding agreement to extend the Second Avenue subway up to 125th Street in East Harlem that they've been waiting for literally 50 years to get done. Every state, every region of this country, red, blue, and purple, has seen historic federal investments announced in roads and bridges, ports and airports, trains and transit, often the largest community investments that they've seen in a lifetime. I also need to mention, by the way, that, that we got a reprieve today uh, in the form of a continuing resolution, but we are really going to need some sense of bipartisan problem solving to prevail in order to get the budget that we need to keep this work up. And here too, I wish the spirit of America's mayors would prevail. You don't have the option if you have a disagreement with your council of the government shutting. You deliver water and you need water to live, so you can't shut down. And the federal government ought to have the same mentality as well. <clears throat> The second thing that I appreciate and sometimes miss about local government is the relentless and unmistakable focus on reality, on facts, on data that cannot be ignored. Local leadership is just more rooted in reality, largely because you're held accountable for it everywhere from local media to the grocery store. Uh, don't get me wrong, I know rumor and misinformation can happen at every level, but in my experience, the truth is never that far away. When you're mayor, if there's a hole in the road and you don't manage to fill it in and somebody calls you on it, you can't say that's fake news because people know that that hole in the road is there. We've got to similarly ground our work at the national level, and that's what we seek to do at USDOT, looking for the evidence that will tell us whether we're leaving each form of transportation better than we found it. We follow the facts, and we're following the facts to see where the results are happening. On supply chains, for example, Pacific shipping rates have fallen by more than half from their extreme peak during the pandemic. And following the events in the Red Sea, we were in close touch with carriers, carriers and DOD to monitor supply chain disruptions. And thanks to the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, American companies have more leverage against international shipping cartels, something that adds up to lower shipping costs, which in turn we know has contributed to lower inflation for the American people. We also know that because of strong investment in transportation and infrastructure and the construction and manufacturing that goes with it, we have an extraordinary, in fact, by many measures, unprecedented period of economic growth taking place right now. We're also holding ourselves accountable to make sure that that continues to reach every American. 
in air travel, just, just a, a few years after observers were asking if we were seeing the death of commercial aviation as we knew it during the pandemic, we've now seen some of the busiest travel seasons on record. And we ended 2023 with the lowest cancellation rate in the past 10 years, which translates to millions more people getting to where they need to be. We did that with a lot of work within FAA and a lot of pressure on airlines which responded to that pressure by improving their operations. When it comes to roadway safety, we're very closely following the inescapable and troubling numbers that we see around the country. We are living through a crisis of roadway safety, something that I have been partnering with America's mayors to confront. In fact, we just had a great conversation with some of our Safe Streets for All grantees. Uh, who around the country are taking steps, deploying federal dollars from the US DOT, but also your own political capital in order to help guide the people who trust you with their lives as your constituents towards safer roadways. I know that is not always an easy conversation to have, but we are here to support with everything from data and technical information to over $1.7 billion that has now reached over 1,000 communities. The reason this matters is because of the life-saving potential of addressing this crisis. We're finally seeing the numbers just start to come down, finally seeing early indications that we are reversing the rise in roadway deaths. But at 40,000 a year, a level commensurate with gun violence, the implication is that if we have a 1% reduction, we're saving 400 lives right there, the equivalent of two or three fully loaded 737 aircraft. This is the power of the decisions that are being made at the local level and the funding that is reaching you from the federal level. Another thing that I think every mayor understands is the importance of connection, symbolically and literally. The importance of unifying and connecting, whether in the physical, social, or even political sense. Mayors live and breathe that work. And often your specific visions for development, maximizing the use of a riverfront or enhancing a parks trail or reimagining a streetscape embody a key insight that we at the federal level would do well to think about, which is that part of how you keep a community connected in the social sense is helping to connect it in the literal physical sense. Or to put it another way, mayors understand that physical mobility is inescapably connected to social mobility. We're working to support you in this too. A couple of years ago, I was in a south side Chicago neighborhood called Roseland discussing an effort to extend the red line further south so people in the community could access the opportunity downtown. I couldn't help but do some mental math because there was a community called Roseland, Indiana, close to South Bend, where I grew up. It's about 90 miles away, but if you were in Roseland, Indiana, and you have a car, you can get to downtown Chicago more quickly than if you're in the Roseland neighborhood in Chicago and don't have a car. We're changing that. We're changing that to make sure that that kind of mobility is not a barrier to people getting the kind of good paying jobs that are gonna help them build up their families. And we were in Buffalo last year where half a century ago, federal funding was part of the problem as the Kensington Expressway cut off what had been a thriving neighborhood from the rest of the city, a story I know you have seen played out in just about every community in the US. We're working to change that. I met an extraordinary woman named Stephanie Barber Geeter, who, whose organization called the Restore Our Community Coalition fought to restore that neighborhood for the better part of her life. And before she sadly passed away a few days ago, she saw the commitment of federal and state funding that she'd been seeking her entire life to deck over that highway, create connections where there had been divisions, along with it, that thing that very few mayors are able to access, new land to use for community benefit with help from this administration. Transportation infrastructure is one of those realms of public policy that every person in this country interacts with every single day. And as mayors, you understand how much depends on delivering the basics, those unsexy things that mayors spend a lot of time thinking about and working on, not just transportation, but water and wastewater and trash and snow removal, police and fire departments. The very foundation of the human hierarchy of needs, starting with safety. Safety, by the way, is why our department exists. It's why we're making sure that we elevate roadway safety, as I described a little bit earlier. 
And on that, I want to lift up the partnership that we have with mayors who now represent over 70% of our nation's population participating in our Safe Streets for All program. And we got a new round opening up in February for planning funds. So please talk to your planning departments about that. When I was here last year, I highlighted some of the cities that have already seen a year or more with zero traffic deaths. Hoboken, New Jersey, Evanston, Illinois, Edina, Minnesota. And now there are many more cities using Safe Streets for All funds to pursue their Vision Zero plans, including Minneapolis, Fayetteville, Arkansas, Spokane, Mount Rainier, Salinas, California. Salinas? Thank you. <laughs> um, hundreds and hundreds of communities benefiting from this. If you're not already part of that, I hope you'll consider it. And while we're at it, I want you to know that we're working to make sure our safety mission benefits people in every mode of transportation. I have to remark that as we near the one-year anniversary of the Norfolk Southern derailment in East Palestine, while I am proud of the work that the DOT team has done to use the full range of our authority to improve nation, uh, rail safety nationwide, including holding railroads accountable, supporting first responders, uh, protecting rail workers, there is a Bipartisan Railway Safety Act sitting in Congress waiting its turn right now. Let's not allow America to get to that one year mark and not have that Railway Safety Act become law. And I think your voices need to be heard in this because mayors and your emergency services departments shouldn't be in the dark about what's coming through your communities. We're doing our part with the, the, the authorities that we have. Congress ought to be helping and we're calling on Congress not to get sucked into any of the other things that seem to be commanding attention over there that don't add value while this continues to sit waiting its turn. I know traffic lights and bike lanes and potholes and some of the other things that mayors work on aren't always considered sexy, but they are profoundly important. And not just because potholes are the bane of every mayor's existence, at least that's my recollection, but because those basics are the foundation for everything else. And that's where I think we need to keep a level of fidelity to a philosophy of public works that recognizes the intimate relationship between the most important and difficult things people have going on in their lives. I would even say the meaning of life and the most basic workaday things that municipal government takes care of. You make sure these things get done so that people don't have to worry about it. You can't, if the meaning of life for you is to be a good parent to your kids, you can't fully be present for that if you're not home in time because the road isn't in good shape. If the meaning of life for you has to do with your faith, you're not in a position to concentrate on that if you were distracted by uncertainty about whether drinking water is poisoning your children. The meaning of life for you has something to do with entrepreneurship. You won't be able to fully live a life of your choosing if the public works that you count on aren't available and you have to worry about working around them. Something even bigger is at stake right now, which is the fate of our democracy. President Biden often says that the ability of democratic nations to deliver is being put to the test right now. When the basic economic, political, and social conditions of our civilization deteriorate, including our infrastructure, public trust deteriorates with it in a vicious cycle that costs the legitimacy of democracy itself. On the other hand, when we deliver on those basics, including infrastructure, people feel the benefits of their democracy through a better quality of life. It's why filling holes in the road or filling holes in the national EV charging network or filling holes in our supply chain are all investments, not just in US transportation, but in the durability of our democ democracy. As a fellow Former mayor of mine, Andy Burke, once put, a good city government tears down the obstacles that stand between people and a life of their choosing. By making sure people have the basics taken care of, you are helping to preserve their very freedom. There's always a lot at stake for America's mayors and America's cities, just as there always is here in Washington, but that is exceptionally true in our time, as our nation struggles to deliver on its promise. And as Americans sometimes question whether democracy can deliver for them. So much depends on your work and ours. But we are now here to support that work with resources that have not existed in my lifetime to help cities get their job done. Yes, we are with the federal government and here to help. <laughs> but this time we're backing it up. 
with the funding as well as the technical support as well as anything else you need. So I just want you to know how energized I am by the excellent and extraordinary work of America's mayors and how confident I am that as challenging, troubling, and even dark as the last five, 10 years have been in many ways, we are going to remember the 2020s, America's infrastructure decade, thanks to President Biden's leadership, and America's democracy decade, if we get right the assignment before us at every level from the federal to the local, we will look back with great pride on this moment and what we were able to do together. And I'm here with you every step of the way. Thank you for your great work and thank you for the chance to join us.